Welcome to episode 153 of Destination Linux. This is a podcast about using, learning, and sharing our passion for Linux and open source. Whether you're a noob or a master sudoer, you are welcome here. I am Ryan, and with me today are the baby Yodas of Linux, Noah, Michael, and Zeb. Yeah, so Zeb. Yeah. So Zeb, how has your week been? Uh, my week has been great, actually. Um, it peaked on Wednesday of this week when we saw the release of Peppermint 10 Respin. So it's been a bit busy. It's been well received so far, um, but hey, it's it's early in the week yet. So we'll we have a bone to pick with you on this, Zeb. That's okay. You can pick it in a moment. But my week is now especially good because I'm off until the 6th of Jan. Oh, on. wow. So what do you plan to do Linux related in this time off? Absolutely nothing. I'm <laughs> just uh, chill out and do what it is I do every day, which is sit in th- front of this thing and vegetate. Is there a chance we may see more live streams from you during this time off? Well, funny you should mention that because I made a rather foolish decision, uh-huh. or rather, was it might be an inspired decision? Inspired for sure. To do a 24 hour charity stream. Whoa. And I'm going to attempt to drive ETS and ATS. I won't say nonstop because I'll need tea breaks and stall breaks and all sorts of other things. Um, so 24 hours, probably every four hours I'll have a little break. And I may need you guys' help to just jump on Zoom and fill some of the gaps or oh, yeah. chat, chat with people or whoever. And if if we can find a video of Free Geek, so let's say 10 minutes long or five minutes long, I can pop that up every time I want a little break. So no, yeah, that's cool. So the charity is the free geek charity. And the charity is the free geek. And yeah. every donation made during that stream is going to go to free geek. Yes. That's yeah, correct. And we're also going to have it like directly just go to the link and we'll have that in the show notes as well as in the description of the live stream when it happens. So mm-hmm. you're going to have to take plenty of stool breaks to <laughs> bleed a 24 hour stream. <laughs> well, I think if I take if I take a break every four hours, I should I should be able to I should be able to manage it. But there are already side bets as to what hour in the stream I'm going to fall asleep in the chair. <laughs> yeah, twenty four <laughs> hours that is that is tough. I've thought about it in the past. I've seen those things, but the only time I've stayed up twenty four hours straight is during network outages and things like that, and it, it's brutal. But uh, hopefully, it is brutal, but about all the community ago, will be there to help keep yeah. you up. I managed, I managed to stay awake for 50 hours. Again, it was while an office move was happening and I yeah. was coordinating the whole thing and all the rest of the guys were taking breaks. So 20 years later, we'll see if I can manage it. I love yeah. it. So what's the, what day is that going to happen, Zeb? That's going to be Friday, the 27th of December, starting at 6 a.m. UK time. Nice. All right. So, Michael, tell us about your stool. Which one? There are now three. We, we need what to happen. Yeah, it's, it, it, they multiplied. I'm not sure how, how it happened. Uh, so, in fact, you could say this is an installation of um, anyway. Oh, my God. Bad jokes. <laughs> I mean, you guys started it. You're welcome now. And well, what's <laughs> funny is that after you when Zay was like, uh, I had a great week and then it started like based on like, you know, something happened great on Wednesday. I was like, are you talking about the stool episode? <laughs> is that what, uh, anyway, <laughs> um, so I've been doing a lot of work on the Des- Destination Linux forum. I've been doing some stuff on the, the show and I'm getting ready and I have some n- great news that we're getting ready to uh, launch a couple things. Uh, one of the things is, is a new uh, podcast. We have a uh, someone joining the network that's going to be a fantastic uh, edition. So get ready for that. And also there's going to be some changes to the DLN uh, layout in the new year for the graphics and how we do the layout uh, that's just overall of the, the visual elements of the show. So I'm, I can't wait for that. I mean, I can wait cause I still have to work on it, but, um, it's, you know, it's going to be great. So very nice. So Noah, what's new in your world? Uh, I, uh, have started playing with, uh, some less expensive cameras. I'm just kind of all in on, on IP cameras since I've been playing with those this week and trying to see, uh, if there are some, we, I, I found the best camera that money can buy. Now I want to find the least expensive camera that money can buy. That still is something I'd feel comfortable putting in my house, or at least something I'd feel comfortable putting in my business. And so, uh, the search continues. So I have a, I have a couple that are from Chinese manufacturers and I've got them hooked up to, uh, to a switch and, and watching what traffic is leaving. And I've got a DNS uh, capture going on that is tracking what domains they're resolving. So I can see what they're trying to reach out to. And I'm after a couple of weeks by so, this, because yeah. I, I would imagine a lot of people are looking 
probably giving you even feedback that, hey, I can't afford the $300 cameras. There's yep. something less expensive that I can get my hands in. And I have started after your show, it inspired me to start searching for some options. And you keep coming that I, at least I kept coming to dead ends. I would find one. It looks really good. I would start doing some research and find out there's some hidden thing calling home or whatever in, in, in the background or some people out there mm -hmm. call, uh, calling suspicion to the company's history or different things. This is really challenging to find. Yeah. Basically, camera. basically anything made in China, there's somebody out there that has some evidence that something bad is happening. The thing is, to a large degree, it's there's a lot of ignorance in the community. I've had more people yell at me for my 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 disparaging comments about height vision, and I've literally posted the link to GitHub where there is a project with source code that you can download and run that code, and it'll hack any height vision camera. Like that's a thing that exists, and that doesn't seem to bother anybody. They're like, yeah. well, there's, it's a great picture for the money. I'm like, how do you think they get that great picture for the money? Like, right. Yeah. <laughs> why are they so incentivized to give a three hundred dollar camera away for hundred bucks? Have you thought about that? Apparently not. So, so Ryan, what's new in your world? So this week there was something interesting that happened. I decided to uh, sign up to be a mystery reader at my kid's school. And my kids go to a STEM academy, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics focused academy. And obviously, even in the grade school level, they are heavily integrated into computers from day one. And I've talked to you guys about this in the past that I found it fascinating that the school was completely inundated with Chromebooks and Android tablets. Well, yesterday when I walked into my daughter's classroom and with my Linux Bible of command line scripts to read to them. Um, the first thing that I noticed is all the computers in the classroom had changed. Everything was redone and the operating system on those computers was now windows and travesty this was really. Yeah. This was really interesting to me because I have said from, you know, the very beginning that the, person who's going to own the desktop market are those who get into the education system first. Because once you get the kids who are eventually going to be in the workforce, that's what they're going to demand. That's what they're going to be used to. These are your future engineers. These are your future CEOs. That's why it was such a big deal for Apple to kick Apple out of the market back in the day. Google came in in a big way with these low-cost devices. But for some reason, and I would love to talk to the IT administrator of the school, Microsoft has now replaced all of the machines in that school again. So that's a big shift and an interesting move and made me really consider what's happening uh, I, from that perspective. I, I can tell you why that is. The, the schools function on basically a budget only process. When the, when, the, when the people that make the decisions in education, even for tech, are typically educators, and they're educators that have the most experience in tech, but very rare, uh, unless you're in a major metropolitan area, do you have somebody that works in a school district that they're only, that, that, they're, that are making decisions and their only thing is they grew up with a tech background. Most of those people grew up in education, and they're the ones that are making the decisions. And so a lot of times it comes down to their whether it's true or not, their belief of what is going to be the future technology. And so when Google comes into a school and says, hey, we're Google and we're going to give you these Chromebooks for free because they give G Suite for free to schools. Yeah. And, and and the competing offer is Microsoft, $99 per student per account uh, or whatever the discounted rate for education is. M Microsoft does that. The school administrator goes, okay, Google's a big company. We've all heard of Google. I've used Google Docs. I've seen the demo. This all looks good. I believe this is where the future of technology is. Chromebooks it is. They don't know about the privacy. They don't care about the operating system. They don't care about none of that. They just care about this is the cheapest thing that gets me to my goal, so let's go ahead and do it. When Microsoft finds that out and they come back and go, we're Microsoft. We have a budget. We can do that. We'll go ahead and give you Office 365 for free. Now, all of a sudden, there's a problem because the people that worked in education grew up with Microsoft and all of their education was on Microsoft and all the people that they work with are using Microsoft. Yeah. And so they look at that and go, OK, this is a more realistic way for us to educate kids. And if it doesn't cost us anymore, we're going to go that route. And so it would it, it, and, and you mark my words, if in three years, Apple looks over and goes, we'll do that with iPads and iCloud. 
all of a sudden it's going to swap back to, to Apple, but it will always be the lowest common denominator price wise that gets the job done. Well, you, you probably hit the nail on the head perfectly because there was one other piece to this story is that all the tablets kids use were also replaced, but they were replaced with iPads. So all the Android tablets were gone. iPads were in. The computers on the desktop were all Windows and the laptops were all Windows now. Fascinating. They're both competing for those markets, but very Mm -hmm. smart from a perspective of marketing to get in there, get with the kids, the young kids, and get them used to using Windows. And Apple doesn't really have anything they could really leverage from a laptop market for educators, right? Their cheapest laptop's, what, 1300 bucks. So Thousand. they're they're going there saying, "Hey, we'll give you free, uh, we'll give you subsidized tablets for the kids." But fascinating that Google was kicked out, and that was an interesting move. So either Google wasn't paying attention, maybe the program was in beta, and Google killed it. But <laughs> Microsoft is uh, taking back over. This episode of Destination Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and so much more. You can get all of this plus the world-class customer support for as low as $5 per month, or you can use the flexible pricing structure for as low as 0.7 cents per hour. And that is darn near free. And if you've ever done price comparisons across the industry, we're not just saying that. It literally is like darn near free in comparison to any other service out there. DigitalOcean also has 2,000 cloud agnostic tutorials to help you stay up to date with the latest open source software languages and frameworks. You can get started on DigitalOcean for one month free. And because you listen to this show, you're going to get a $50 credit by going to do.co slash dl. Again, you can get started on DigitalOcean, spin up a server, spin up a WordPress site, learn inner workings of how to properly secure a server using their amazing guides that they have, their tutorials on there, learn more about Linux than you ever have before, and you're going to get $50 to do it for free with, to play with, and that goes a long way in DigitalOcean by going to do.co slash dl. And again, we want to thank DigitalOcean for continuing to sponsor this show and this episode of Destination Linux. And what's really interesting, Ryan, is we've had a comment from uh, one of our patrons who get to to watch the show. And uh, the gentleman said, I use my DO credit to create a transmission server to seed a project's ISO files during an initial release. Nice. Created a server in every geographical location to help spread it around the world and try and save some bandwidth. So not only did you get a chance to test DigitalOcean and work out how it worked, but he got to do some great good for a distribution out there by spreading their ISOs. That's amazing. That's awesome. And he did it with the free credit. So go check it out and get yours. Yep. You can drop it like it's hot. Well played, sir. So this week in community feedback, we have a returning individual who people absolutely love to hear from, Bo. And I think we mentioned him in a prior episode. And when you mention Bo, you're going to get an email telling you <laughs> the things that you did right and the things that you did wrong talking about security. And we, of course, we welcome that all the time. Bo says, hi, guys. Great show. Well, speak of the devil and he shows up. So there you go. Uh, I did want to recover something said about Cali. Yes, I do use it as my daily driver, but I don't recommend it for everyone. As you all said, I do this for a living and I'm doing research all the time. So yes, I do like having all my tools all the time, which absolutely makes sense. Also, there's a lot I do to the distro to secure it in the user mode. For one, I add a user account and lock that account down. I use this account for all normal operations like writing this email. There is tweaking to do to run in a secure manner. There's around 18 systems here in my house all running Linux. And by the way, if you haven't listened to the interview we have with Bo, it's amazing because he does have one Windows machine in there, but it's used as target practice uh, for (laughs) hacking. Only my testing machines run. Kali, the other systems run the best distro for the job they're doing. The beauty of Linux, there is a distro for your needs. I would never run Kali on my TV machine. It runs Ubuntu. My house desktop runs Kubuntu. One trick is to install Kali as an encrypted USB 3 or flash drive and boot from it when testing, which is great advice. This gives you direct access to the system hardware and leaves the loaded OS alone. Here's a link to how to do it from Rapid7, which will be in the show notes. I'd also like to restate something you all said. Never use Kali's tools on a network you do not own or have written permission to touch. You will go to jail. 
And, you know, this was in the news recently too, to Bo's point of even a somebody who had received permission to do testing on a network um, basically ended up getting arrested and going to jail. I mean, Bo's job here is considerable risk. So you don't want to play with this in a hotel or anywhere else but your own home network. A lot of these tools are very powerful. Yeah, uh, you, even if you don't know what you're doing, you can mess things up. You can. And so that's why it's important to never, ever do things like take a second laptop with a USB NIC and boot tails up or something that spoofs the MAC address and run testing on a hotel network that you don't well, have permission. To if you bad know, idea. You should not do that. If you know what you're doing, maybe. Yeah. But that would require things like buying a disposable USB uh Nick and stuff, and you're not giving so people advice. No, no, I'm saying don't do that. I'm, try, I'm trying to tell people, I'm trying to caution people that this is a bad idea and you should not do this. You know, uh, both further clarifies about my rant about usernames being displayed. No, it isn't a CVE 10, but it does give an attacker a crack in the armor. Noah said, Well, if you have physical access, you can just carry it out. This is true, but you have to think most likely that username is also used not only on that workstation but on servers on the network. This is a crack I've exploited in the past and something I look for in engagements. Just my two cents. Great show, guys. Keep up the great work, Bo. So there you go. Adding some industry expertise in there for us and you to consider. We appreciate you sending that in, Bo. And I agree with everything you said and what Noah said of make sure you don't take tails with you on a USB and go to a hotel. And mm -hmm. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great way. That's a great way to have a lot of fun without getting caught. So don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, that's I mean, that's a great way to get arrested if you get caught. That's what I meant to say. I stop. Yeah. Sorry. Clarify. Stumbled over my words there a little bit. Right. Allegedly. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Allegedly. James writes in to say in episode 151, Benito wrote in asking about an open source option for a remote desktop. As someone who's been down this road, too, one of the easiest options I've found for local network is like something called No Machine. It's not open source, but it is free for personal use and is extremely easy to set up. And it's also available for Linux, Mac, and Windows. Although I hate to even mention it, another alternative and free option is accessing computers outside of or inside your local network is the Chrome remote desktop. Gross. Yuck. No. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> he says, I love your show and keep the great work, James. And also, P.S., I think your show tagline should be Destination Linux. Come for the Linux. Stay for the banter. I like that. I'll take that one. Yeah. Now, I, I wouldn't recommend Chrome Remote Desktop because I I would highly doubt there would that would be safe at all. And I would think that would be highly targeted by multiple things, including potential add-ons to your browser and other things that could exploit that. I would stay so far away from that. It is an option, just a terrible one, but no machine is interesting. Mm. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any experience with that. It's the first time I've heard of it, but something to take a look at, at least if you need an option and one of the open source options available doesn't work for you. We love hearing from our worldwide community. We have many ways for your voice to be heard. You can send us a short email or video that may get incorporated into the show. Send your video links or emails to comments at destinationlinux.org. It's Christmas time. So it's the season, season of giving, and we've partnered with Free Geek for a very special DLN give back charity campaign. So Free Geek is helping to reduce e-waste by recycling machines and getting them to the hands of people who couldn't afford them otherwise. In addition, they're holding educational courses and working with the community and other businesses to get people online. This helps children and adults alike complete their homework, college, and learn important skills for their future. So join us in supporting this, in this important campaign at destinationlinux.network slash freegeek and consider giving a monetary donation or sending them some of your equipment if you have some extra equipment in storage or some older equipment or that kind of thing so we're also we're very proud to be a part of uh this this campaign and helping with free week and working with a, the community as well for this charitable organization and we just we're we're super excited about it and we hope you are too so be sure to go check out destinationlinux.network slash free geek and also be sure to check if you want to learn more about free geek we had a great interview with hillary show honey from free geek on episode 151 so be sure to check that out as well so yeah Christmas time. Wow, that singing. Is that extra for our patrons or do they get that for free? No, that the, the live the live performance is is, is actually free that's... for the patrons, but yeah. And you complain amazing. about having to edit? Well, there's two edits for a start. No, I'm keeping it. <laughs> I'm keeping it. Wow. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, so on to some distro news. And this week we had the uh, announcement that, that why well, wait, what? Linux Mint 19.3 is released. Ryan, what happened to Peppermint 10 Respin? I'm well, shocked. You know what happened to Peppermint 10 Respin? We asked you about it last week. You and said couldn't you couldn't tell, tell us, and then it came out the same day the episode aired. So you know How what? Was... We're bitter, and we're holding a grudge, and we <laughs> refuse to talk about it because you didn't give us nothing. <laughs> How was I supposed to know it was going to come out on the same day? Because you are friends. Michael could have edited it, and it would have come out on the Thursday, not the Wednesday. You know wait, what? wait, that's fair. <laughs> It's kind of fair. <laughs> anyway, I've decided that Peppermint 10 is so good, it doesn't need endorsement by Destination Linux. <gasps> it will survive by itself. However, one sneak preview, if you haven't already checked it out, and if you haven't, why not? We now have a Destination Linux SSB straight into the menu so people can get to their favorite podcast from within Peppermint Linux. How Wait, cool explain that? that for me, Zeb. So you're saying if I install Peppermint and I type Destination Linux in the menu, I'll have it there? Yep, because it will come up as a, a, a Destination Linux uh, single site browser, an SSB that we have put under internet. Oh, my He's gosh. Awesome. That is the coolest thing ever. That's awesome. All right, Peppermint's back on. What's your favorite <laughs> feature of Peppermint Respin, Zeb? The um, the destination Linux single site browser, obviously, naturally, yeah. Um, and if I had to pick one item, it would be the um, browser choice that we've now integrated into the control panel. So, like uh, I think Budgie does and Theron OS does, you can go into settings, you can go to the web browser management and choose from a dozen web browsers that you want to install or uninstall. And you'll also be happy to know that not one of them is a snap or flat pack. So they are nice. all proper installs. But there's, as, there's a whole raft of other little minor tweaks and changes. Go and check out the Peppermint website. It's well worth a download and a quick review. Absolutely. But on to a new release of Linux Mint 19.3. So Linux Mint has a new release named Trisha. The latest version of Mint comes with support until 2023 and packs a list of enhancements under the hood, including system reports now includes detection of potential issues on your computer, like missing codecs, hardware drivers, availability, or language packages. It has improved HIDPI support. Celluloid now replaces XPlayer as a default multimedia player. Uh, they stated Celluloid has better performance and hardware acceleration. Now, this one surprised me a little bit but because XPlayer was something that Mint themselves created out of another player. So to drop that in favor of something like Celluloid speaks volumes for Celluloid. So if you haven't checked it out, Take a look. It's also yeah. also specifically because the like the X player was based on an old version of Totem and Celluloid used to be called GNOME MPV, I think. And I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure that's the one that changed. So the the powered by MPV is makes total sense why this was a be a, a the solution. So that was a good choice. Cool. Um and they've made another quite quite surprising choice. Um GIMP is replaced with drawing for a simpler new user tool. Um now I don't know about you guys, but GIMP can be as complicated as you want it to be. It can be a simple drawing tool, or it could be a quite powerful editor. Now, I know Michael doesn't particularly think it's professional grade, but it, that, that, I, that I found to be a strange choice. And I'll, I'll catch yeah, they, they talked about this in their notes, basically saying that they replaced GIMP, which I was happy to see. I was hoping they would just say we replaced GIMP with Glance or something along those lines, but they replaced GIMP and put this new drawing tool in that basically is a clone of paint, Microsoft paint, I would say it's very simple. And they said they were looking, you know, most of the people who are new to desktops or using new users are not looking for something that's a professional editor. They're looking for just a simple paint program. I'm not sure how much I buy that. I'm sure they have some data that shows otherwise, but I, I don't, I like you, I never found you know, that GIMP was particularly difficult to hmm. utilize or that I think if people go in and see paint first, that that's going to give them a better impression. I, I think seeing a professional editor might give them a better 
better impression of Linux, but eh, there you go. They did it. Mm -hmm. Now, they've also made a couple of other changes. They had the hardware detection tool was added to the BIOS menu uh, of the ISO images, um, and they're running the Linux kernel 5. Now, there's lots more tweaks and enhancements to this release. Um, So if you're a fan of Mint, go and download their latest release and let us know what you think. Well, I actually did install it. And one of the things that we talked about was this system reports now includes detection. And I wondered what it was actually doing. And it was it was quite interesting what it was telling me to do. But one of the things that I found quite strange was that they're having this love affair with time shift at the moment. So one of the recommendations was you have no backups. So, um, yes, I can understand why they want people to have backups, but to say that it's detection of potential issues on your computer i don't know whether you guys would condition would consider not having a backup an issue no and i don't want the operating system making that decision for me i you know it's if i have an rsync script which is very popular in the enterprise space right if i have an rsync script that goes through and, and copies all the data off or maybe the vast majority of the data isn't on the computer itself maybe it's on an nfs share that resides on a zfs machine that machine is getting backed up is my computer not being operated properly because my data isn't backed up no it's on an nfs share and it, it, it's being handled outside of the operating system's knowledge yeah, yeah. i mean at the same time the whole you know, community in IT as a whole, not just in Linux, is always saying you need to back up your data, you need to back up your data, you need to back up your data. I don't see any problem with notifying people, you know, hey, this is an option here for you to back up your data and then you dismiss it. I don't think it continues to annoy you once you've dismissed that alert. Zeb, I, at least I never noticed um, it did. I think I think it does, especially in the update manager. Okay. One of the things when you first run the update manager is you have to go through their little steps. And one of the steps is you haven't backed up an update. And then the next time the update manager runs right along the top is you haven't enabled time shift. And in fact, the only way to get rid of it is to uninstall time shift. And then it's got nothing that it can point to. Um, hmm. so, but, and, I, and I've got no problem with them saying to you that you should do a backup. I right. just have, I have a problem with the idea that they're saying that your system has a problem because you're not doing the backup the way they want it done. Yeah, I well, think it could be just a reminder. You know, I think, and we've talked about this in the past, and I want to get into this a little bit, Michael, if you don't mind, about some of the concerns that have been there with Mint in the past that led them to use this time machine backup, because I think that's probably a big reason why they have this kind of annoying thing. Um, but before I do, I just want to say, I installed Linux Mint 19.3 in a virtual machine. I booted it up. And it took my breath away how gorgeous it is. I mean, the Cinnamon desktop is so beautiful out of the box. The icon, the theming, the wallpaper, the whole setup is so beautiful. Michael, going into some of the issues in the past and why Time Machine became a resolution to one of those issues, the idea of them kind of notifying you to, hey, set up Time Machine is important. Explain why. Time shift, but yes. Oh, yeah. Time shift. Time machine. You know my Apple way. He gets confused (laughs) with his Apple stuff. Yeah, I love my Apple stuff. Naturally. Um, So there's the issue that great. It was around before the time shift happened. And by the way, time shift is not a solution. It's a workaround. Um, Some people would refer to it as a Band-Aid. And the reason is because they have an infrastructure that is based on Ubuntu, but it doesn't do a clean fork. So if you do a if you look at the difference between Ubuntu and Debian, it's Ubuntu is a fork of Debian. It's, it's a derivative, but it's also a fork in that all of the packages that are in Ubuntu are pulled from Ubuntu and not directly from Debian anytime you do an update. So they take all the packages at one time in Debian and then put them into Ubuntu and then they do their thing on the top of that. Whereas Linux Mint has a weird thing where they sort of fork and sort of don't. They take some packages, make their own version in their own repos, and then they also use the Ubuntu repos for a lot of other things, probably most things really. And this creates an issue where there's a compatibility thing between what Ubuntu does and what Mint does. So if Mint were just to fork everything, this problem wouldn't be an issue necessarily. But because they don't do that, they have this weird, sometimes uh, in the back in the day, they had that one through five priority of like our warning levels of what could be happening. And the only reason is because sometimes on the four and five, they were bringing in core elements 
from both their, their repo and the Ubuntu repos, creating this weird mix and match thing. And it could have created an issue and they didn't have a solution for that because I, whatever reason, and it was, the solution was essentially a workaround by putting in time shifts. So if something does happen, they can just kind of ignore it and go back. You can just roll back into the previous version. So it does solve the user's problem, but it doesn't solve the technical issue of the disconnect. So I was fighting with you back and forth this week. Uh, people who don't know me and Michael pretty much after the show, will pick some random topic to argue about for over a week. Um, and this particular Naturally. one we were arguing about was related to a couple of things with Mint. First, it was that, and you were showing me about telling me about the ISO situation or PPA situation. The PPA, uh, they, they had an ISO issue thing too, but but that, that's yeah. a different thing. That's more that was a fluke. Uh, but that the, was a 2016 thing, yeah. But yeah, the the problem that the PPAs have is back. They they still have the problem, but it's not as a as not a big a deal as it was then, uh, because in 2015 is or so, I realized they had this issue. And what it is, is that there's this priority system that it's built into Linux. Every Linux system has a priority for the repos that you can pull from. And this is set, you set a number value for that priority for the repo, and it gives you a uh, list of being able to control the order of when something is pulled from. So, like for example, Ubuntu by default, their repos and basically every repo uh, Ubuntu provides or PPAs are all set for priority 500. And the way that you can change this number and it will change the priority, but you don't actually have to do that. All you have to do is make sure that your pro the repo you want to have priority is set higher in the list so it checks that first and then goes into the rest. Now, this is a, a good solution, and that's not what Mint did. Instead of that, they they do have it at the top, but they also changed the priority system or the priority number for their repos. And they have it from 700 to 750, depending on which repo you're talking about. Now, what happens is if you install a PPA, that PPA is set to 500. And it creates a conflict between what, no matter what order it is, the repo for Mint is automatically taken over because of that priority number. So if you install, if you want to install an application, and admittedly, this is a rare thing because you have to, you have, one, you have to find an application that is in both the Ubuntu packages, the Mint packages, and a PPA, uh, so that they have to, they had to have pulled it from Ubuntu, made their own version, and then you also install a PPA to get it. You'd have to do all that. So it, fair enough, it's not a huge issue and especially not with the flat packs and snaps and app images anymore. So it's, it's still, it's less so, but the structure is still in place where when you install a PPA and you install an application from that PPA, you will not actually get the application from that PPA because the priority of Mint takes over. So you're pulling from the Mint repo instead of the PPA you just installed. And the only way to fix that is to manually change the pin number or the priority number for uh, for the repo for Mint, or to manually install the dev package from the PPA, which will then force the particular PPA to become priority. And then so it will start I called, pulling. I called nonsense on this live with you on the phone. Right. And then we did a test, and unfortunately you were correct. Uh, yeah. It installed the old version. Instead of giving me the latest version from the PPA, it installed the old version of the package from their software store and ignored the PPA entirely. Mm. Which and, and really, that's quite shocking for a, a new user that's just learning about um, Linux. Um, and I'm assuming it's going to do that for the NVIDIA drivers as well. So you're wanting the latest 440 off of the NVIDIA PPA, and it grabs the three, the 435 off of Mint. It's it's possible. The, the, the issue it really depends on if if Mint decided to fork it in their repo or not. If they didn't fork it, then it's not a big deal. But if they did, right. then it would be. Well, the first issue is you're running NVIDIA. The second issue would be how Fair enough. Mint handles that package. Uh, the second thing we called shenanigans on, or I called shenanigans on, was this whole idea that Cinnamon and Gnome is single-threaded because I found a fancy command that allowed me to take the PID for Cinnamon and it's PS, TAC, O, NLWP, and then the PID number for Cinnamon, and see how many threads that process is actually using. Right. And I had 32 threads dedicated to the Cinnamon desktop. Mm -hmm. So I've seen multiple articles saying they were working on, you know, a year ago or more, making the GNOME desktop, therefore probably Cinnamon and others, into multi-threaded process. 
But right. Michael, you corrected me again, darn it. Right. So this is an issue of people looking. I think they they understand what they're what they're wanting to talk about, but they're not understanding the different nuances of the words that are put into the different infrastructure. So like it's the same thing with people using the developers using stable for a different meaning that what users use it for. And in the case of you know if you're in a hardware case, you have a certain number of cores and you have a certain number of threads. And the threads are typically double the amount of cores you have, but they're not real actual cores. And in the same thing with, with software, when it runs in your system, you have a difference between a process and a thread inside of the process. So you can have multiple threads and still one single process. And in the case of Cinnamon, it does have that single process, multiple threads. And the problem is not the threading, it's the process. Because if the process crashes, which is the most typical thing that happens in this case, is once that process crashes, the whole DE crashes. And currently, we use X as the default of the display server, and X is it has its own built-in mechanic to fix that, and or mechanism to fix that. And you can uh, really recover pretty quickly with for both GNOME and Cinnamon because of the X uh, fallback. But Wayland doesn't have that fallback that I've te like that I've known for now. They might have fixed it in the past six months or something, but prior to that when my and I tested it if you because of the single process thing if the if the process crashed any reason whatsoever the whole thing is done and you have to restart it you might you could maybe log out drop to tty and start over again there or just reboot how whatever but if you didn't have if you were working on something and you didn't have it saved it is gone and that's the problem with a single process now cuz x has that fallback you know fixing it it is not a big is not a big issue right now, but in the future it could become a bigger issue. And it also is still an issue in the sense of how much um, resources being used by different processes and stuff like that, rather than splitting it out. So yeah. there's there's it's that issue too. Though. And there's one more thing that while I will admit that I haven't tested the latest version, they may have fixed this. There was an issue at one point, or is maybe, with Mint doing a thing where the the profile for the Firefox installation is the same on every installation. So when you install Mint, you have a profile ID number and setup that is identical to everyone else using Mint. And this is a bad idea because it means that if something happens in Firefox, there's a bug found in Firefox that allows for some kind of you know catastrophic thing, not likely, but if it happened, whatever, it means that everybody in Mint is automatically affected because everybody is sharing the exact same version and the same structure setup. And that creates another problem. So there are a couple of things I like to go back. I think what we were doing most of all, um, all joking aside, was really testing some of the theories and things that we had heard in the past mm -hmm. to see if they were still true. Some of them still are. Obviously, some of them have Band-Aids on them. Overall, though, I think Linux Mint looks gorgeous out of the box. I was blown away by it. I like some of the things that they've done yeah. uh, for simplifying um, getting the codecs and packages that you need right away within the distro itself. And I really like their hardware selection screen from the um, boot from the boot up standpoint because it's just something to allow you to know what hardware on your machine is immediately detected in the BIOS menu of the ISO image. So you can go into this hardware detection tool and see if it's detecting your fingerprint reader, your video card, you know, your audio, all of that before you go through the installation process, for instance. So you'll know, hey, I'm going, it's not even detecting the fact of my wireless card. I'm going to have to plug this into Ethernet and, you know, in, in order to do an update and pull that driver down and those type of things. So it's pretty cool, some of the options that they're building into the tool. And despite our geekiness reservations, it is still probably one of the top two go-tos along with Ubuntu. So Ubuntu and Linux meant new user to Linux Chuck that at them and they'll be. Oh, yeah. Be to be clear, I recommend Linux Mint. This is the one I recommend to new users all the time. This is the one mm -hmm. I put on machines of people who are like, I always ask when I'm repairing a machine, can I interest you in just putting a Linux distro on? And I put Mint on there always because I know it's going to work. I know it's beautiful. I know it's going to be familiar to people. And I've converted a lot of people thanks to the work that the Mint team does. Yeah. And I also want to clear, clarify something. While I am on the geeky side of it and I'm aware of the technical issues, so I 
it, there is a part of me that it does ha see problems with mint. I also agree that there is it is a very nice looking distribution. It's very polished. They have put a lot of effort into that, and I respect the effort they've put in. And it's just like if these hangups weren't there, I would have no problem recommending it. I still recommend it for brand new users in some in many cases because it is still a good distribution. But these problems don't need to exist. And all I'm saying is that if they fixed it, it would have such a huge potential to to change the landscape of what is you know recommendable or whatever. Like that's exactly. that's all I'm saying. I would love to hear from the community. We have a lot of people out there that use Mint. Maybe you could test some of these things we've talked about and let us know. And we'll you know put your emails if you don't send us eight paragraphs uh, into the next show. <laughs> and uh, you know we'll read it out to everybody to see if some of these issues may have been resolved. We don't run Mint on a regular basis. I did install it in a VM, but you can only get so much out of a VM experience if you're not using it as a daily driver. So for those that use it as a daily driver, let us know which of these things have been resolved or maybe you're on the plan to be resolved and we'd love to cover it. So we got some good news from the GNOME team. They have dual GPU improvements coming to the a future version of GNOME. The GNOME Vel developer Bastian Nacera, I'm sorry, uh, put out a blog post discussing enhancements being made to NVIDIA dual GPU setups in upcoming GNOME 3.36. This is, is oh, it's so embarrassing, Michael. It's GNOME. Sorry. Oh, oh, I'm so, I'm so, uh, sorry. So, uh, Bastion details issues with the old detection code in Switcheroo, which is a fantastic name for a control settings thing. Uh, Switcheroo dash yes. control, which included a requirement for graphics card to use VGA Switcheroo and the kernel, which NVIDIA driver doesn't do. Didn't, uh, didn't know which GPU was the main one, and GNOME Shell expected the Mesa OpenGL stack to be used. The fix was to extend the Switcheroo control and its API to be capable of handling all of this. You know, it's it's really fantastic. I just like saying Switcheroo now, so it's we got to have it's more amazing. stuff. It's <laughs> amazing. It's such a good name. It's we get so good. many bad names in Linux. Yeah. But Switcheroo, that's a good one. That's a good it, one. This makes me think that uh, Ike Doherty's involved, because didn't, didn't he have a doohickey as well? <laughs> yeah. I think he did, yeah. So a KDE user also wanted in, in on this control, and Bastian addressed this by stating, uh, comments asked me about the KDE support and how it would integrate. It turns out that KDE's code just checks for the presence of a file in slash sys, or SYS, which is only present when VGA switcheroo is used. So I would encourage KDE to adopt the switcheroo control dbus API for this. So, so you know why I put this in here, Michael, because with your you know, uh, arms into the KDE world, I think you're the one who could, you know, put this bug in their ear to say, hey, let's make this happen. That's, that's a fair point. And in fact, the fact that we don't have switcheroo in a plasma support, we need that. We need just because of the name, really, but we need that. <laughs> so, so well, uh, they should put a K in front of it, K switcheroo, then it'd be KDE. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's, well, that's our a guarantee, really, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Well, but but it, it could probably end up as a switcher coup control. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with that too, so, sort of. Anyway, if you want to try out the new controls, check out Fedora 32 as stated in the blog, which will have GNOME 3.36 and Switcheroo fully integrated. So before you get on to the next one, though, Noah, can we just have 10 deep breaths, please? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no phone calls. <laughs> Overinflated price. <laughs> the battery only lasts an hour. Now they're going to try servers. <laughs> the hardware overheats. I feel much better. Thanks, Seb. Yeah, drink your bubbly. Oh, that's a good idea. Take a sip of that $1,200 yeah. can of bubbly. It's cheaper than the server. <laughs> <laughs> Purism is in the news again today with a new announcement. The first is the list on the Librem 5. Five phone. Now, this is the phone that we were super excited about. You can go back and watch the past episode of Destination Linux to find out all the things that we really liked about it. But uh, good news, the phone is actually getting a price hike. So if you weren't happy with the price before, um, you'll now go and pay an extra $149 for the low, low price of $749 um, for a phone that doesn't they're working on the phone calls. They almost have that working. <laughs> but whoa, 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 whoa. Like, let's let's be fair. Let's be fair. Uh, that's actually the first price hike. It's eventually going to go up again for two seven ninety nine. Oh, okay. Well, so you have. So now is the best time to buy the phone if you want to no, get a good now deal. Now is not on the, the best time, Noah, because they said that the now is the prototype stage. 
Okay, it's the second best time to buy the phone <laughs> if you want the prototype phone because it's a 5.7 inch display with a 720 by 1440 resolution display, a whopping three gigabytes of RAM. Now, to put that into perspective for you, there was a budget Samsung phone that had six gigs at AT AT&T for 199 bucks. But for $749, you can get three gigs of RAM, 32 gigabytes of storage. That's almost enough to store some videos. Thanks, and there are reports that Michael's pictures of stools could fit in that 32 gigabyte. All of them. Exactly. Yes. All every, of them. every last one. Every last one. And great news. They're getting closer to making phone calls. So you can buy a $750 phone and it'll actually make a phone call. And they are working on the overheating issues. So hopefully there will be some progress there. And the one hour battery life is still a problem. But there are some great deals on Amazon for external battery packs. And you can take those with you. And so... Who's to complain, right? So anyway, if that didn't excite you, now they have decided to venture into the server market. And so the Librem is going to release a server. That's right. They've announced another new product. So the Librem server comes with, as they claim, no proprietary firmware. And they're using Pureboot, a fork of Coreboot, because for some reason, Coreboot wasn't good enough. And the server starts at the low, low price of twenty six ninety nine. So if... Stocking stuffers. For, st- for <laughs> right? whatever reason... For whatever reason, you chose not to go with the Dell, and for whatever reason, you chose not to go with the System76, and for whatever reason, you didn't choose to, just about every other server out there, starting point, uh, then you could pay twenty six ninety nine and get the Librem server uh, on up to fifty nine ninety nine. So your choice there is, I would say, the Librem server or the Trash Can Pro. Both of those would run about the hey, same price. Fifty nine ninety nine. You are going to get 12 gig around there. Come on. Okay, so that accounts for about 500 bucks. Where's the other 4,500 come from? Uh, the core boot. Oh, right. So anyway, there's a two to three <laughs> week lead time. So hopefully this isn't a server you need anytime soon. And they do state that Librem is already a success. Now that's Librem stating a success. Nobody else. But Librem server is already used successfully in established business customers in the past years that serve up important clients like Boeing, GE, NASA, Toyota. And now the company is opening up the product to general availability. So my first question here to you guys is... Do we have anything that substantiates this claim that th- that Librem servers are being used in well, when Boeing, I saw GE, this, I NASA, thought, and Toyota? I thought this was fascinating when I saw this because I thought, my gosh, if they actually have important clients like this, then that, that is a big deal. That's a huge win for them. And, and you know, we, we we make, well, we don't really make any humor. We read the facts of what yeah, the, 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 the reality are. is. That they, that they, we the facts that it, they write, and then it's funny. Yeah, yeah, we're not making this stuff up to no, be. Like, they made it up, you know. Anyways, um, this server. If you look at the wording, I, I posted this in my Telegram chat for Dos Geek, and some uh, Dustin from Ubuntu Budgie picked up a very specific wording here. It says. Librem server has already been successfully in use by established business customers for the past year that serve important clients such as Boeing, GE, NASA, and Toyota. So you have to really read between the lines there. Those aren't (laughs) their customers. They have people who work. You got to give credit to to their marketing spin. It's not marketing spin. This is flat out dishonesty. If you want to say, if you want to advertise, if you want to name drop people that you serve, then you better serve them yourself. You don't make something for some third party that you know. Th- so what they made the the the, the, the Libra server was used on it was used on a development yeah. server that was used for the camera system that GE and NASA. I mean, come on. The, if, if you're going to drop, you're going to say that it's in use by Boeing, GE, NASA, and Toyota, then NASA better have said, well, we're dumping all of our servers and we're we're going with Librium because that's that's the good choice. That would be NASA choosing to go with Librium server. Boeing saying, hey, we tried Dell, we tried all these other ones, none of this worked. We went for Librium. Again, this has been my criticism, all joking aside, this has been my criticism of Librium since day one, is they don't understand their audience. Is there somebody out there that'll pay $6,000 for a server to know that everything from top to bottom, all of the microcode is open sourced and available? Yes, that customer absolutely exists. Frankly, you're probably looking at them. I'm the kind of guy that would spend $6,000 because of an ideal or because of an ideology. That's me. But I'm not going to spend that money on a company like Librem, where every every announcement you uh, we have to sit, the fact that Ryan, that you have to post this in a Telegram group, and it takes a collective group to try to interpret and boil down, and then condense, and then give back in plain English what it is they're trying to advertise. That to me is is a level of dishonesty at the company I don't want to do business with. Come out and tell me, hey, it's a six thousand dollar server, it's a hobby server. 
the, the reason that you would buy something like this is because you have a belief. It's not meant for high-end you know, business production because, frankly, we don't have any real, uh, re- real-world use. And companies like Boeing, GE, and NASA, and Toyota are not going to up, upend their, their, their corporate network and, and dump all of their commercial enterprise servers to go with, with, with somebody's science project, right? And the fact that, that, that they put this message out there and expect people like me who do sell six, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars servers. I just got done bidding out a job for a law office with the with the twelve, thirteen thousand dollars, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars server. When you get to when you're working at that level, it, it's pretty clear that a company like this is it, that's just not where they're at. And the fact that they don't understand that is why they're going to constantly be behind because companies like System Seventy Six. They do know their place. They go, here's our niche market. Here's what we're trying to serve. Here's our customer. And guess what? Colleges all around the country are using System76 servers because they found out that, hey, this is a company that makes a product that caters to the Linux and open source community. So if you're going to run Linux and open source software uh, because of development or because of chemical calculations or because we need some sort of science thing, System76 is a good choice for that. Librem could be could be great competition in that sphere. They could absolutely compete with the Dells and the System76 of the world, but they have to knock this crap off and they have to actually put a server out there, let somebody try it, build up a reputation with a with a with a reasonable uh, market base and then bring that to people and say here's where it's been successful real world examples not marketing spin not we made you know a, a thing for the for for the uh, for the guy who collects the cardboard he uh, his the the computer that you know calculates the size of it uses that and they pick up the cardboard for Boeing so hey we serve Boeing right Pharonix. For those concerned about open source and transparent servers down to the microcode and firm, firmware level, we would certainly recommend Raptor Computing Power 9 Talos 2. Guess who's at every single conference, or at least the vast majority of Linux conferences that I go to? Uh, uh, Raptor? Is it Raptor? <laughs> no, Purism. <laughs> <laughs> so the the when when these guys, and and I had a, is Hugh Lemmings is I think the 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 guy's name and I, I can't remember the exact episode but I had him on the show and I was able to talk to him because he's showing up at all of these conferences and and talking about what the advantage of uh, the the Power Nine architecture is and why people should care and you know and and what it's actually doing. You can see these systems. You can play on them. I have seen uh, I have seen Librem. I think at one of the major Linux conferences. By the way, it's Ask Noah Show One Twenty. Easy to remember. ans.st slash one two zero. It's the power of open power. And and when you have companies like that out there that are using an alternative architecture, a very expensive computer. Those Talos systems are like two three thousand dollars, and yet. Everybody at the conference and everybody that I w- walk into goes, man, I'd love to have one of those. When I was rebuilding this workstation, I thought about buying an open power system. Why? Because I had a chance to meet the guy. I had a chance to try out their system. They have real world examples of Google and other companies that are there. It's not some third party. They're actually using open power systems. If Librem would, would, would approach it like that, I think they'd make more headway, but build a phone, build a laptop, build a server, build something, but continue working on it until it actually works. Don't give up halfway through. Don't go on. And it's, it's the, it's the, it's the shotgun approach. Throw everything at the wall and just see what sticks. Wouldn't you be scared if you had ordered this phone and you're a big believer? There are people who believe in this a hundred percent. And I, I shared an article out there. I've also posted on a discourse forum talking about the phone spying on your location and what that means for national Mm -hmm. security and everything else. It's fascinating. I get why there is a market for a phone like this 100%. And so do you know it. And I would pay, I would pay $699. Someone made a comment about whether we could afford it or not. I mean, I have phones here that are worth well over a thousand. So would I pay $699 for a phone? I would do it in a heartbeat. Me too. No problems asked, but the thing that we're talking about here is if you, (laughs) I have to get three hundred dollars worth of value for my eight hundred dollar phone. Exactly, and I'm get and it's less than fifty bucks if I can't make phone calls and the thing doesn't work and I've got three gigs of RAM, which is literally twenty twelve specs. Like, yeah, I, I mean, yes, I will overpay for something and because of this principle. Scare you from a backing standpoint if you had back this phone that this company continues to now announce new and new things that are coming out when you know they were already stretched thin to even fix this phone well, that and then, has one hour battery life and heating issues and everything else. And now they're launching servers and other stuff. It's just, 
It just, well, and so here's and here's the other part of that too, right? What does it actually mean when they say they're launching a server, right? They're because rebranding we know some other it, server. Out exactly, there. It, because yeah. it's not like they're building. A, they're not like they're soldering motherboards together in their garage, like Steve Wozniak or anything like that, right? I mean, these are people that they're, they're buying things, they're flashing different firmware on it, and they're selling it as. A, and so, if if that's what you're going to do, again. Be honest about that. Tell me what you're doing. Explain to me where the value is. There, I don't. I can't count the number of times I've been to a conference where somebody will tell me, "The oh, System 76 are just rebranded Clevos." Though the people that say stuff like that have no clue of what they're talking about, because if you actually go into System 76 and talk to them, you'll find out where their value. At. I mean, they're literally taking these machines apart and resoldering things and putting things in to make them compatible with Linux. That's what you want from a company that's selling a, a, a laptop born to run Linux, right? Librem could be that company. But st- from the day one, when they launched the very first laptop, it was the elegant, sleek, very expensive, nice thing. That was also free and open source software. And I just, I remember thinking to myself, so they're targeting the Richard Stallmans of the world and they're pricing it like a MacBook. Like those two things don't mix. The Richard Stallmans of the world don't pay two twenty five hundred dollars for their laptops, and the kind of people that pay twenty five hundred dollars for the laptops couldn't care less about free and open source software. They want a laptop that works well. So either make a laptop that works well on Linux and don't worry about Microsoft, you know, open sourcing down to the firmware level, or open source down to the firmware level, but just get the laptop. Don't make it pretty. Just make it functional. And they they didn't get that. They clearly it hasn't resonated with them yet on the phone and now they're going to venture into the server market a place that's far more competitive a much bigger budgets way more oversight you know you can, you can convince somebody on the internet to go buy a 750 fifty dollar phone i promise you you're not convincing any business to, to, no, to buy six thousand dollars servers successful ge nasa right, and yeah. toyota use it so yeah. well uh, next okay. time i'm at toyota i'll okay. ask them if i could get a demo of their Librem system to be fair to be fair we we in, I am fair. Okay, so to be fair, we we didn't re, re, co- we didn't talk about everything. We you know there is some new more information and news about the oh, the, okay. the Librem Five. Now the, sure. there's a USA version that costs two thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. Um, I take everything. Sorry. Back. Yeah, yeah. So me too. You know, <laughs> we, we were wrong. All those comments saying we were yeah. wrong. You're right. I we wasn't wrong. wrong. Yeah. I don't I don't lose ground. Remember. <laughs> And you remember in the previous topic, we talked about Linux Mint, and at the end of our listing of the things we had a problem with it, and we listed all the things that we liked about Linux Mint, and now I'm going to list all the things we liked about Purism. So up, up next in the show, we're going to talk about the gaming section, and Life is Strange 2 is coming to Linux. Now, yeah. Life is Strange has been, got a lot of overwhelmingly positive reviews on Steam. It's like 129,000 of them, and it's been around since 2015. And they recently uh, brought out Life of Strange, Life is Strange 2, uh, just you know, somewhat recently ago, and they are now bringing it to Linux. Actually, it's already on Linux now, right? As as of this this recording, so. Definitely go check it out. It the the story for part two is on the run and sharing a terrible secret. Brothers Sean and Daniel can rely only on each other in a world that has turned against them. With the po- police on uh, on their trail, they must keep moving forwards to Mexico. But the road is long and daunting, and relying on the kindness of strangers brings it to its own dangers. But so yeah, that's actually uh, you know it's an interesting concept because if you look at the way that they work with Life of Strange, the stories in that game are as good enough to be a movie and stuff like it's, it's emotionally solid. intense if you want to know mm-hmm. about if you're confused about gaming we have some people that say i don't like the gaming sk- section i skip it all the time maybe you've sat down and you've played mario and you're like what's the point saving a princess from mushrooms and all this stupid stuff i get it i do get it right if you either grow up with it and you get it or you don't but things like this basically puts you into a movie that you're playing and and can bring emotions out of you like a movie does and that's what makes Life is Strange such an incredible success story um, because it's not about going around just shooting everything with the gun and some random battlefield or whatever. It really is about the emotional engagement in the characters. So I don't know many games out there that have 129,000 overwhelmingly positive reviews out there. I honestly can't think of another game like it. It's obviously a AAA game. But the big thanks here, in my opinion, goes out to Feral Interactive for bringing us another awesome yep. AAA title on Linux. So appreciated from them. Yeah, it's a, it's a good story in the game. And it's also a good story that we have companies like this doing this work for Linux. Yep. And guess what? It's not pixelated. I know, Zeb. <laughs> it's stunningly beautiful. In our software spotlight of the week, we have NetHogs. 
Now, NetHogs is a small net top tool. Instead of breaking the traffic down per protocol or per subnet, like most tools do, it groups bandwidth by the process. So it's very easy and efficient to determine what might be slowing down your traffic or what is causing traffic, what's sending traffic out from your computer. I've been using NetHogs recently and I absolutely love it. And in fact, found an old process that was running, an old backup process that was being sending data out to a server inside my own home that no longer was active on a Raspberry Pi that I could go out there and kill. So it was trying to send data to something that never existed uh, for backup purposes running NetHogs. So it's just a really, really cool tool. Go download it, install it, run the command. I think you're going to absolutely love it. If you start using it, you're just going to keep using it. I've used it all week once I found it. Since I basically devoted my last like month and a half of my life to IP cameras, I thought I'd give people uh, some uh, uh, another tip or an idea of how you can get a camera system in your house. One of the big feedbacks that I've gotten over the past few weeks is, hey, I'm interested in this, but I'm looking for a more budget friendly way to get a camera system up and running. And, you know, there there aren't a lot of good free options out there. And so I'm still evaluating them. But one I came across this week um, is a, a product called Orchard Core VMS. And Orchard Core is a free video management software that actually can run on a Raspberry Pi. And to the best of my my understanding, as I'm looking through it, there is uh, it's made by a company called IP Configure, and they have a commercial version, which you pay for, and a free version called Core, which you can just download and use. And there's no licensing fees, to the best of my understanding. And so I I have it installed on a machine, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to run it for a little bit and see how things uh, and see how things work out. But if you're looking for a free way to, to to run a Raspberry Pi, I did have a listener that reached out to me and said, hey, this is what I'm using. And I checked it out. And it's it's actually pretty cool. So uh, nice. check it out. You can find it at ipconfigure.com. There seems nice. to be endless uses for this Raspberry Pi device. A big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening to Destination Linux. If you want a behind-the-scenes pass into the making of this show and an opportunity to chat with us live, consider becoming a patron. I think we're going to have more patrons than ever before so that people can see the unedited trolling of Michael and his stool from our last episode. No, no, no. But if you Three stools. Now we have three stools. That's right. So you get behind the scenes access. Our, our patrons help keep this show going and they get perks like access to live recordings. And if you can't make that, you get the unedited version of the show. And the best part is you can join for just a few dollars on Patreon or Sponsus. So check us out. Destination Linux Network also has a way for you to become a part of the community by going to destinationlinux.network and joining our forums, our Mumble servers. Really, we say our forums and our Mumble servers, but actually, it's like an entirely different world. If you've ever played Second Life and you you create your new online oh, life, like this. Yeah. this is creating your Linux life. You create your Linux portfolio on our forums, then everything is tied to everything else. And so you can just become into the Linux world right. where we talk about things. We like, assimilate you. Basically. That's right. And we spend $749 on phones. So while you're there, check out all of the shows. You can be a part of the network. There are shows being added all the time, like DLN Extend, the podcast that takes the hottest topics and deep dives into all basically everything that we get wrong, they go and correct. So we don't actually have to do work. That's great. We like those guys <laughs> most days. And when they disagree too much, then we fire them. Uh, but yeah, check all, all of that and check out all of our shows at destinationlinux.network. So please get back to us and provide some feedback or ask any questions you may have. There are numerous methods that you can do this via. We've got comments at destinationlinux.org, our Telegram group, Discord, Discourse, Twitter, Mastodon, and other ways that where you can find us are on our website at destinationlinux.org forward slash contact. So please keep your comments and questions coming. We love to read them and hear of ways we might be able to improve the show. And a special for this week, and I don't want any duck, duck, go images, send us your picture of your beloved stool. See if you can <laughs> outstall Michael. And like I said, I will be checking each picture that comes in. And if I find it on Google, you're out. So <laughs> send us the picture of your stool. Who can outstall Michael? Wow. Yes. Wow. So, yeah, if you want the, the con more content, the fun doesn't stop here. We also have our own channels that you can check out. You can go to uh, youtube.com slash dosgeek, where you can find Ryan's content where he fills your brains on hardware, software, and all things tools. Yeah. 
Zeb can be found on his youtube.com slash Zebedee Boss. You can find him playing games like uh, Project Cars, or Euro Truck Simulator, America Truck Simulator on his Zebedee Gaming YouTube channel. And also be sure to remember December 27th where he's doing that 24-hour live stream because, he's, because he has way more, uh, he's got way more courage than we do. And yeah. uh, also check out my content where I do an in-depth weekly Linux Good News podcast called This Week in Linux and other Linux-related content at tuxdigistool.com. And <laughs> you can find Noah at asknoahshow.com where he does, does a weekly talk radio show at 6 p.m. Central on Tuesdays. You can join him and answer. He'll answer all your questions, Linux and tech related questions. I just want to stop and point out that if you have a hard time remembering the website for Ask Noah Show, you can also find my show at linuxstool.com. Oh, wow. That's a new change. I love that. Yeah. Great job. Yeah, we, 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 we looked at what you was happening. No expense. We were looking at what was happening in the community and decided that was something that we really needed to to capitalize on and uh, and work on marketing. So Linux.com. Win, win. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So everybody have a great week and enjoy the holidays or have a festive Christmas. And remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Thanks, everyone. We need to make these. I had a shirt idea. I actually, I rich. actually bought LinuxTool.com. I don't know if you thought that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so if people go to it. Does it, yeah, it forwards to ask? Yes, it's a real site. I I own I own LinuxTool.com, and it definitely forwards to ask Noah Show.com for the time being.